she did her homework. She really um, did into therapy, and I think we were put together about eight or nine months. A lot of times they come in. Uh, it is a two-year program that they would be signing up for, um, but depending on the person's response to treatment as well as the difficulties that they're going through, it can be different courses. It's not not really the short-term therapy that we tend to think of these days. We have decreased depressive symptoms and arousal levels, which is supported by the assessments that we did. She began engaging more critical thinking, making more effective decisions, and challenging the color distorted beliefs, a sense of being undeserving and, and, and unlovable. We began challenging some of those. Um, she was able to establish appropriate boundaries in relationships to meet needs and maintain self-care. Um, she didn't, she <laughs> blew her mind the first time that she said she wasn't going to make dinner, and the kids did it themselves, um, adult kids. So, you know, they made her dinner, and they thought that was great. They'd never been able to do anything like that for her before. And so, it was a risk she took in committing to my activity, but, you know, she began to take risks. She really got a really risk rewarding response from that as well. And it doesn't always work out like that. You know, I was saying, if families were on it'd be easy. So it's, that is a risk you take, but it worked out really well for her at home as well as at work. And she reported increasing her own sense of competency and self-worth. She was sleeping through the night within a few, <laughs> within a few months. And at the end of treatment, it was a collaborative decision to, to terminate therapy. We had not done the processing. It was talked through that she was able to come back at a later time. But she was thrilled that things were going well. She was able to... Um, to feel good about herself as well as get everything done by the end. So moving forward, what I'm really hoping that you guys will get from this presentation today is an increased understanding and empathy for survivors of prolonged childhood abuse. They come a lot of times with a lot of crazy and attached, you know, trying to make sense of what they've been through. By the time they're adults, people feel like, I feel like the kids get more sympathy. But really, it's just compounded time and again for the adults. I really hope that you can, if either you've been through it, you know someone who's been through it, that there's increased understanding of what goes on for them, that they're not bad people. They've just been put in bad situations, never been taught how to help themselves out of it, or had someone to guide them. Increased awareness for providers in understanding their work as survivors, that this is a much different approach than typical PTSD um, treatments. There is help available with time, work, and support. Many people are able to overcome a lot of the difficulties um, associated with complex trauma. And that uh, there's benefits not only to them, being able to have a real life, what we call a life worth living. You know, so a lot of the suicidal tendencies will hopefully drop off. And it'll be a life that they really enjoy and appreciate. But also their families and society, we saw the amount of money that goes into supporting these people. As I think hurt people hurt people, right? And then, uh, you know, essentially having them they feel damaged and also not able to contribute to their full potential. The benefits of society as well. Um, for providers to really learn more about complex trauma, I've, you've heard the statistics, trauma is something that's attached to many of us. And so having an understanding of it, even if it's not the work you do every day, can be helpful in um, understanding all of the populations we work with. For other people, um, difficulties that you, a lot of the things that you're seeing and the things that frustrate us with these people are due to past experiences, but there is help available. And I think, you know, Taylor's study and the PAHO study are just the first part. I'm really glad to see Kima is doing it. There's a lot more to be done to really understand what's going on, as well as to understand how the treatments work within the humanity community as well. <laughs> ever left but <laughs> it's just really good to have you you know amongst us um i know that was two sort of very big presentations and we have uh, hilton grace coming up and he really wanted a breakout session he's good with like stretching it out and like taking a little breather um but any reflections on what you've heard between dr bottom and myself so far before we kind of switch gears mm -hmm. just huge it's going to take a long time to process it. yeah it's a lot of information and Brilliant and very very to understand like to see it firsthand and hear it. Um, it's phenomenal, but well, that's gonna that's gonna take me a week to go through in my head before I <laughs> And the reason why I, I really encouraged Lexi to lift the veil, the curtain of therapy. Um, we didn't really want to water it down for you. We wanted to to have a, a, a you know a, a bird's eye view of what actually goes on. Do you guys have like some sort of 
legal obligation to get supervision because without that your brains would explode like so. <laughs> <laughs> I realise that's not very eloquent. Every once in a while. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but for example, is yeah. that that's part of the like the medical practice here that exactly. you have to have supervision. And, and that's echoed in what we've talked about is just the training the, and all that supervision and, and peer consultation is absolutely essential. And so when there are people that do any kind of work, whether they were trained in a formal structure or not, um, you have to realize that it, it is so complex that there can be damage done to the provider, to the mental health professional. What was, what's transferred. the phrase you used on the, the, the dissertation? Uh, the vicarious part? Where, yeah, where, where, where you absorb, I can't remember the yeah, you, but you absorb some damage. Yeah, that's the vicarious post stress. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Where you absorb um, contagion. Contagion, contagion yeah. that's what it is, yeah, that was the word. I think there's a movie called Contagion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about as violent in my head as this. <laughs> yeah, but it's true, we do, I think absorb is a really good word um, in a lot of ways, and so we, we have to train ourselves and, and get with each other and yeah. learn how to protect ourselves and then help to heal the person or persons in front of us. Yeah. So it is, it's a very multi-dimensional process. Um, but I think it's important because we're talking about how do we work together, how do we collaborate amongst all of our different you know, elements in society to know what we do, right? What you said before was to not be afraid and to, to not compete with each other. But in order to, to remove that fear, I think we need to be aware of what each other's roles are and what they can be. How do we improve that? How do we you know, merge together and fill those gaps and make sure that we're encouraging each other our strengths and then you know, fitting in collaboration? Right? I think you have your hand up first. So. Okay, well, thanks. For both of you, uh, I know there are a lot of um, cultural issues, as I mentioned. But for example, did you all come across any um, Anything significant in relation to spiritual, sp uh, religious beliefs or the influence of the church, which is a big, obviously yeah. a big thing, you know. Yeah, it's definitely a protective factor. Um, you know, it's something that the, the person particularly can cope well with whatever negative elements are going on in their life, and that's something that we would encourage. There's nothing specific. I don't know if you're asking, is there a specific? What, what I seem to see or or imagine is that in many cases, um, there's a sense of betrayal by the church or even schools or police authority figures that are supposed to protect or teach young people, kids, this is how life is. Or when abuse happens, they know about it and they hide it. Or I think in many cases, there's a sense of betrayal and uh, rejection of those uh, institutions. I think it's an individual element, you know, if someone feels very strongly and supported by their spirituality or by gardening or whatever the case may be, then we would highlight that factor as something that helps them cope with it. But forgiveness is a very controversial topic amongst survivors themselves, right? So we cannot prescribe that faith-based um, element, um, but the theme of betrayal naturally brings up the contrast of forgiveness, right, and trust building. So whatever works for that person is really what's important. And for some, it will be you know, spirituality and religion and forgiveness. And for others, it will be something else. And so it's really important to be client-centered and to know what provides that particular person with the growth that they need, that positivity, that hope, that healing. Yeah. And if I could add as sure. well, that, that really being focused on the client is important, uh, especially this thing that stood out to me since coming home. Because I've often found spirituality to be a strength, but if the religious aspects are part of the trauma, mm -hmm. then that becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, it can play it can play a role in very in different ways. So really finding out for the person what it means to them can be helpful. Because it is more damaging when that which is meant to be compassionate and empowering is actually the stick that you're being beaten with. So yeah. that 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 is terrifying, you know. And yeah. um, just to, to to your point here, I understand. I really do understand what you mean, and from personal like, experience without like, divulging names or something, there are certain senses of betrayal, even when you follow absolutely to the letter procedure and reports are made, and then nothing's done about it. And then, you know, you're in this horrible position, 
of wanting to protect the child and you have follow procedure and then contacting directly social workers and being told, you know, it's, it's okay, it's being dealt with, but having no visible follow-up at all, you know, the, the person, obviously I'm not going to name the names, but the person who I am thinking about specifically has just learned to, to cope with stuff and has moved out of their house and there has still been no follow-up. So there are definitely cases just over the past few years where even after following everything to the letter, there is still a betrayal of being ineffectual. And I don't, I, from my own point of view, I don't know how to make that better. And I think when we're talking about collaborating, if, if there is absolute transparency here with respect to confidentiality, with respect to professionalism, but if we are able to come together and genuinely make it child-centered or, I don't want to say client because it's the wrong way, I don't want to say victim either, I just person-centered, if we make it about the people genuinely and we are able to collaborate and transparency is able to take place, no disrespect to any religious backgrounds, no disrespect to any cultural backgrounds, the only aim, the only end goal protecting our kids and making sure that they're in a better position than they would be if this is allowed to happen. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. yeah, I'd just like to thank both of you. Sorry that I got in and didn't hear um, the keynote presentation, but um, the presentations from you and Dr. Bodden, I'm just feeling so thankful that we have um, young professionals like yourselves being able to help us to deal with some of the issues in our society that those uh, patterns just need to be broken and I'm thankful that you're seeing that the family and the community need to work together you can't just deal with a person in isolation that it has to be the, the family dynamics have to be changed as well and able to help that person. Um, so I'm looking forward to a lot more positive um, things happening. And I hear Lennon's question about the church, because um, in my own work and in different experiences, again, it depends on how the church approaches issues and approaches its doctrines and its teachings um, so that from some quarters, we've heard, well, you're causing more harm than you're helping. So we have to be conscious of that as well, and, and to be able to talk about issues uh, openly. Because yes, um, churches should be a place where you can go and talk about various issues, but sometimes it's just pushed under the carpet because we don't want to talk about it. So it needs to come out in the open, perhaps presentations like these to churches um, would be great as well to be able to help within their youth groups, within um, persons working with children, to be able to help them to know where the help is from. So we could look at, at that, that maybe we could um, invite you and others to do a presentation at, for, for churches and church leaders so that they have a better idea of some of the issues that you face as counselors. I mean, there are some pastors that are counselors, but you wonder how much that they interact with the other professions. Right, and I do think there's, a, there's a, definitely a role for that type of support in a person's life. But again, if we're focusing on how complex this is and all the training and supervision necessary, um, I think sometimes people will turn to a religious um, you know, mentor uh, and expect maybe the results of this kind of treatment. Well, yeah. It can be tricky, but I think everyone, again, needs to have their role, and it's a wraparound effect that we're looking for. Um, some of the, the models um, in terms of shared care that are emerging in the States and in Canada um, actually look, I, mean, I think that it was mentioned earlier about the sort of patient-centered care, mm -hmm. and, and in those models where you have a shared care plan where the patient um, working with a lead agency, because there's always the funding issues, right? So looking at like whether they do bundle payments, they're looking at different mechanisms depending on whether it's a or not-for-profit. 
um, but having like a lead agency, but then having the patient have a lot of input in terms of who is involved in that shared care plan, what information is disseminated and what roles they play as they go through their journey. And so I think that um, is a lot of what's, uh, what's started to emerge over the last five or six years in terms of how to bring people together without having to do dramatic wholesale change on the infrastructure of health and, and <coughs> social services and education. Like, it's so hard to formalize to bring together, but if you focus around the patient and a lead and then bring together with consent and privacy respected, then that's the kind of thing that I think we're talking about moving towards. Mm -hmm. I think you had your hand up. I, I don't really know how to articulate this question, but you were talking about um, fear of um, liaison or like the joining or the uniting of different agencies and the roles that everybody plays. But what I've seen, um, especially with like inmates, um, they don't want to go to the formal um, counseling, like treatment or um, they'll rather have a good friend in another agency that they have really made a bond with. And um, that person will get um, slack from maybe the other agencies that are there are put in place to help. But the, the person doesn't want to go that avenue or that route. And then the person or the mentor that they kind of look at will get shunned for doing that kind of, or taking over somebody else's role. And um, I was just wondering what advice or what, um, what, how we would shift that thinking, if you understand what I'm trying to say. I don't know. Well, I'm not sure if I'm reading it correctly, but what came to mind when you were talking was just really being aware of our own comfort zones and our own expertise. Uh, from the mental health professional's perspective, if there are people who do not feel comfortable in the advocate, educator, social justice role, then to be honest about that and to say, oops, <laughs> I think I know how to fix that. I need this educator. I need all these people involved in this, this person's care um, because my limitations are such and such, right? So it's not that everyone has to go out and play all these roles, but to be mindful of both the person that you know is coming to you for help and yourself. And that can change over time as well. Right. Is that right? As the person evolves. Mm -hmm. And as they get more trusting of other people, mm -hmm. it's always a yeah. trust. It takes yeah. a long time to build trust, right? I think what would help with that too, though, is of course that's based on relationship. And beside relationship, we have to have a continuum of care. You know, prior to somebody even getting in the community, there should be that established with mental health, with all the other agencies. There's going to be a continuing. So that's something that's, well, I've been advocating forever for that. But seriously, that has to be in place, and then it will work. I know it's a bizarre analogy, but. The independent music movement, as opposed to the professional music movement. The professional music movement is about making money with bands and generating cash. The independent music movement is about creating a collaborative. And if people were genuinely serious about this, mm -hmm. then the most important thing to get out of the way is the impetus of finance. Because yeah. if, if we can get rid of money, if we genuinely can. Building a school in Zambia shocked me totally because there are people in Kazagul who don't use money. They genuinely, this fishing village, this fish, village fishes, this village grows grain, this village hunts. And without money in the equation, people just look after each other. It's the most phenomenal thing in the world. So if it's possible that we could genuinely create a collaborative, we could look, there's a lot of people in the room, we could look for ways of generating cash, whether it's sponsorship, whether it's investments, whatever. We can do that 
And then, much like the independent record label, we could take down every one of you as independent artists. What are your skills? What are your abilities? What are your strengths? What would you be willing to give to this? And then we've got a, a little book of talent that we could bring to every meeting and go, okay, this is our first case. Let's see who we can use to help. And if it would be possible to do, it would be phenomenally successful. Sign but, me up. <laughs> that's it, isn't it? That's it. Sign me up. I would like to share with you a, a kind of positive example just to make it lift everybody up because it is possible. Mm -hmm. um, very lately in, um, at the crisis center we had this lady um, who needed a lot of help for herself because mm -hmm. you know she was of course a victim of domestic violence but also for her child um, who was abused as well. And what we did, we kind of organized like a conference of all the agencies and all the parties involved. And it was the mother, the, 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 the child, then it was our children program case manager, and also had a uh, representative from the Department of Education because the child was, you know, his grades were falling. Then we had uh, a, a person from, a representative from uh, DCFS, from FSU, and they all sit around the table, and the effects from what happened were really, really great. And, you know, and, but I think what, what needs to happen is someone has to recognize that this is needed and, um, and then there has to be someone who is in charge. So in this case, the children's program case manager from the crisis center, she, you know, she took kind of charge of it because the, the kind of overall, uh, overall feeling in the room was, you know, like, okay, so who is now doing what? You know, what do you want from us? And she's like, okay, well, and we're putting it together like a strategic plan, what each agency has to do, what is the um, deadline for it, and you know, and, and they still collaborate to this day. And this family is, is one of the examples of our great successes. So I think, you know, if we, we can like, sit there and say, oh, you know, this is what needs to be done, we just have to do it. Yeah. And it's possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but wouldn't it be amazing on a national level if we could replicate that success? Yeah. That would be phenomenal, right? I think you're right. I think it's happening. It's happening already. I certainly, in any complex case, would start off with a multidisciplinary meeting inviting all agencies. Whether they choose to attend or not is another matter. Yeah. Whether anyone is released and given permission to attend is another matter. Um, and certainly, um, m much of my work is with um, children and young adults with disabilities, and that's a model of care that we always use. We use person-centred planning, you know, we get someone from every agency and we have an action plan and we have a meeting every three months and we call people to account. What have they done? What did they do since last meeting? What are they planning to do next? You know, that's a model that's used all over the world and we should, as individual practitioners, be introducing that. And then you get a ripple effect where everybody's starting to do it. Um, and I think many of us are doing it, but we're not doing it in a connected way. Yeah. And, you know, you, you talked about finances um, what happened after a few sessions, it was recognized that actually you know, each agency can save the money because we see ethics much faster, mm -hmm. right? And everything is happening, you know, falling in place, this agency follows up, and it's like, you know, instead of putting all this, you know, these hours into, into working with this one family, if we sit all around the table and we spend one or two hours, everybody together, we have much better. When it comes to people, collaboration is better, yeah. right? Well, I think the collaborative effort, um, you know, from when I was a prosecutor in youth court many years ago, um, over 20 years, the case <coughs> conference process um, guided by DCFS to help the families. That was something that was supposed to have continued and have a continuum of care for the whole family. So um, that is a process that is endorsed by the children's law. So it really should happen. If it's not happening, then it should be happening. Mm -hmm. So that um, that is part of the, the process. Because for the, from the court's perspective, the child's interest is paramount, always. Mm -hmm. And so that the court has to be satisfied. If there's anything dealing with the court system, there has to have been that collaborative effort um, and it's trickled down now that it's just should be standard whether or not it's a matter that would have to come before the court. Whether you're just looking at a child in need of care and protection, whether you're looking at a family that needs help, that should be DCFS's modus operandi at all times when a child is involved. 
Can I just add to that? That's an important aspect that has to come under your policy. Because you said something important to, and I've lived that, where people want to be a part, but they're not given permission mm -hmm. by their specific yeah. departments. Yeah. But if it's set up where, you know, this is the way things should be, then it works that way. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if you provide, like, common tools, right, mm -hmm. common care plan tool, mm -hmm. agree on assessment tools, then that also makes it a lot easier to have those mm -hmm. conversation and exchange of information. Okay, if you permit me, I'm going to change things up a little bit. Um, Kate O'Brien was uh, kind enough to bring a poster presentation from k Music Therapy, and I just want to draw your attention to that. If you want to, before you leave, look at it and, and ask her any questions. Um, and I also uh, have Avital Zeisler here, and I wanted to maybe give you an opportunity if now, if you're okay speaking now, before Hilton Grace. Okay. Sure. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Abby Talon. And, uh, and just it's such an honor for me to be here and just to see what's happening on island. Um, I'll give you guys a little bit about my background. I'm a self-defense instructor, and I became a self-defense instructor as a way to overcome um, the trauma associated with the sexual assault. I've been working in New York as a hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor. I went pretty far and I kind of went really, you know, as far out as I could to really learn how to defend myself. And you know, you're talking a little bit about it, but um, I was able to get myself functional in society, but I wasn't really healed inside. I felt very disconnected. And I had um, a breaking point, it was my lowest moment, that I finally realized for me that real self-defense, that I could approach self-defense and use it to create, live, and protect the life that I love. So I learned how to recreate, you know, my own life, the life that I wanted. And when I started to work with other women, I, I stopped teaching security in New York, and I just I've dedicated my life to it. And, you know, I have so many opinions and, and ideas. Um, and one thing I didn't address was that, for me, the feeling from the presentation was hope. And it's something that I have every morning, because I know through self-defense that we can protect the younger children, that we can arm them with the mental and physical skills to be safe, but also to create their self-worth and to really know how to protect the moments that they want to experience. And that's the work that I do with women and also, you know, with, with, um, with some children, not as much, my, my focus is mostly, mostly women, but as a method that I created for women continues to grow, I am starting to work with, you know, different demographics. And so, you know, speaking through personal experience, it, you know, it is possible to, you know, really just overcome and then also survive and also prevent violence. And for me, it's really going after the children to arm them with this knowledge as young as, as we possibly can. So I just, you know, yeah, just really amazing to be here and to hear this, and I hope I can help in any way possible. Such a pleasure to connect, and you have your book signing on Thursday. Right? Yes, at in Humana Bay. Yeah, I wrote my first book um, on self-defense on the method that I created, and it's also just an example of how parents can really work with their children to learn, you know, these concepts and mm -hmm. and really just I don't know bring self-defense into everyone's life in one way or another. So, and I just want to say, um, after that, two years ago, um, together with Ronnie. You, you guys uh, put the self-defense course for the clients of the crisis center and for the public, and it was a fundraiser for us. So that, that, that there, are, there are ways of raising money and raising awareness and playing the streets. Thank you so much. I'm just moving on island and doing one on, on the 27th and then to raise money for you guys. So, so yeah, I'm hoping to. 27th of this month? Of this month, yeah. And you can see her TEDx talk. If it's not, probably still online. On the I live think it's stream. still online, yeah. So they have the DVR version still available online, but then they'll do post production and upload it to YouTube so you can watch watch it, you know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're ready for Hilton Grace. Mr. Hilton Grace. <laughs> the one and only. <laughs> Um, PowerPoint? Yeah. All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Hilton Grace, work with the Wellness Center. I spend a lot of my time with a group of young people in a program called Passport to Success, uh, mainly ages 17 to 21. Uh, 
Yeah. And I had a chance to look at the, 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 the part of the study with them. Um, well, just some basic information from them. So this, this evening I'll be sharing some of that. And there are two questions I'd like to focus on. One is what are the implications or the impact of the information I'm going to share? Uh, Dr. Augustine touched on some. You heard it from her. Are you actually going to see it and what you think about it? So that's one question. The implications are the impact. And the second one is what are the opportunities? Because I, I really believe that it's important for us to examine opportunities despite whatever the information says. All right. It so right I concur. There we go. I think it's the other way around. There we go. All right. Um, so sometimes it helps for us to, to get a sense of really what happened in, in, in this study. Um, there were 955 young people who participated in it. And it looked, all of them were between ages 15 to 19. It's highly likely that they had very few 19 year old if any, but because of the, 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 that was an age cohort that they were actually looking at, the, the, the actual participants were between 15 to 18 because our high school system has no one in there who was, who was 19. Um, they, they, it's self-reported, which, which pretty much they are filling out these things by themselves, uh, these questionnaires by themselves, no real pressure to lie, and when you do something called external validity, once they can establish some kind of pattern, because they do this right around the, the region, etc., um, you can establish some patterns. So you get a sense that, for the most part, the information was truthful that was shared. Uh, they, they looked at various areas, pregnancy, abuse and violence, mental health, substance abuse, that nutrition, hygiene, family, school connection, very important uh, ones to highlight, um, something on that, as well as healthcare access. So they, they, they did this survey looking at um, basically what the young people's experiences were. So, and that's a lot. In management of 55 is really, really substantial. First aspect I want us to look at is the exposure to violence. Half of the young people in school experience bullying, 54.4% have had this kind of experience there. Um, another had very direct and aggressive uh, interactions where property was deliberately damaged. 15.6 uh, were physically threatened. 12.8 actually actual attack. Now, this occurs at school. It's just one of the environments. Um, now, as, as, as you look at this, you're, you're saying, whoa, this is what's really happening at school. It is, it, it is certainly telling. Um, <clears throat> so if we were to combine all of this, this exceeds more than 100% in terms of exposure. Because if they're not experiencing the bullying, they're seeing it, and they're seeing all of that. So they're experiencing this even though <clears throat> all of them might not, as, as you can see, like 12.8% have really been physically attacked. But they're seeing this. This is an environment where violence is, is constantly perpetrated. And we're not even looking at the exposure to violence at home. Now, the Cayman Islands has no, no civil war going on, but this kind of exposure to trauma is extremely serious, as all of us here know. Now, again, with the terms of violence, sexual abuse among females, uh, I think that's the thing they said it was six times, or it's, yeah, three sixes, 18. So these are the guys below 3.1%, which, by the way, may not necessarily reflect the truth because males are less likely to report sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So it could, it could be slightly that, it, that it's in higher. Um, but look at what is happening with, with, with our females. I, I had the opportunity to discuss this with. Um, some of my, some of the young people that, that I work with. And when we talk about the first sexual experience being forced or you know, being threatened at, at 8.1, when, when you're looking at this, this, this could easily be about 15% of our young people who are having a first sexual experience in a very traumatic way. This is, this is very telling. Uh, and from the outside, we might look at it and say, well, all of this is not very obvious, but for 
or your people have self-reported this, it is really, it is really telling. Mm -hmm. Going on further, early sexual initiation, even though it's, it's, it seems it seem tiny, 5.2% females, but then it suggests that our, our males at 11%, and this is one of the few things except for substance abuse where, where males are more, are more exposed, what is happening with our, with our young men? A lot of them, again, on this, again the, the society in terms of looking at sexual orientation and so on, are pushing our young men to actually engage in early sexual activities. Very, very telling. Now let us look at the mental health aspect of that now. <clears throat> Again, in talking to, to, to the young people, they were like, well, we get depressed. You all think that we don't have problems. <laughs> but when you're looking at their, connect, their connectedness at, at, at school or in the homes, it is very telling because they're saying that we're not able to relate to our parents. We're not able to, we don't feel that a lot of teachers really like us or have our best interests at heart. And so they feel very, very disconnected. And um, hence, half of them in this, in this report reported having been depressed. Now, when you look at that and break it down further, look at the, the suicidal ideation. But what's even more telling is almost 60% have actually made plans of carrying out the, the, the suicide. Um, they said there are some similar findings um, in terms of suicidal ideation um, among, with, within the English speaking card. I'm not sure, you know, does this, I'm not sure exactly if they were referring to this or just specifically to, to, the, to the ideation. But these are some huge numbers that our young people are experiencing. And it is mind-blowing when you look at that info. We, 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 I'm quite sure most of us in this room are very much aware because of the kind of work that we do. But when we step back and look at that, we have to really look at what are the implications, but also what are the opportunities in terms of for the young people themselves, for us in the profession, and for the community at large. Cigarettes, alcohol, and, and, and other drugs. Now, 53.3% had consumed alcohol within the last 30 days. Interesting. But you're having a lot of our young people, which I, I'm, I'm putting it out there, that really there's a lot of self-medicating going on, with 51.3% have ever been really drunk, which has happened on 10 or more occasions. What are our messages about alcohol use with, 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 with our youth? Um, what, what are the boundaries that we're, we're putting in place? But even though we are asking that question, many of you are aware that traumatized people, when once they, they have not sought the help that they need, they often self-medicate. Whether it is, well, obviously it is with substances. And it is very interesting for us to look at those and see what can we really do. Um, this surprised me that there were no real significant differences in alcohol consumption, male and female. Where, where, where I'm from, men are kind of more encouraged to drink. Um, and I don't know if it's because of the number of bars that are in the Cayman Islands, <laughs> but uh, females drink a lot, seem to drink a lot here and it showed up in that, in, in that information. Um, marijuana use, very significant, 8%, 35.2%. Well, that's kind of a shock. I was expecting it to be much more. <laughs> yeah, because of how, how, at least, just listening to people, how more prevalent it, it, it is. Um, and just from my own engaging with, 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 with you also, I get a sense that a lot of girls are also beginning to, to, to use to use marijuana, being introduced by the boyfriends, of course. Um, well, let us look at how early they're being introduced to, to that, between 30 and 15. 15, 
15 years old. Now, other drugs were reported relatively low, uh, but what we know about this, as our friend here from Ms. Rose from NBC will talk about, uh, gateway drugs. Starting off with whether it is marijuana or whether it is drinking, most people who end up using hard drugs, they usually have a history of being introduced to these things first until they go back. Um, this now, I, I, didn't, I didn't put the, the one on family connectedness. There was a lot of information. But this part here was about how much people really felt left out within the school system. 50 to 33% of them reported that they were not really, they didn't feel collect, connected to school because they, they, they felt, and again, perception is not, not always reality, but if it speaks like a goat, <laughs> makes them sounds like a goat and eat grass, <laughs> sometimes it is a close relative of the goat. <laughs> so they thought that teachers never are really care about, about their students. Um, they never are really feel safe at school, and, and that, that's spot on if half of them are being bullied or being witness, witnesses to, bull, to bullying. They thought that schoolwork was hard, and just as Dr. Alexander spoke about, um, is that Dr. Park? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Alexander and uh, who, who spoke about just the, 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 the wiring of, of the brain, and how, again, it becomes hard for people to concentrate if they are, one, they are, they are still not fully developed, if they're consuming, Different, different kinds of substances, they're exposed to this kind of trauma. No one in school seems incredibly hard for these young people. Um, and they really, this is serious. And I'm, I'm just thinking of myself, I never thought of school of being, of not being happy at school. In fact, you wanted not to be at home. <laughs> but here, right here, they're expressing that they never, they rarely feel happy in school. And it's, it's all connected. Bullying, feel as if teachers don't care. Um, and also, a, a, a lot of other kinds of activities, if you feel that the work is hard, etc. And pretty much this, we have to look now at what are the implications. And I, I hope that you write on and we're going to get a chance to talk. And I just listed one there is the normalization of violence. If half of our people expect, expect to be bullied or have experienced bullying and those who are not bullied are witnessing it, then, and they all may also be experiencing that at home, then you get a sense that this is normalcy. And there's a real danger and we have to really look at the implication. How do we reverse that kind of thing? Um, just looking at also the, the schools, and I've done some work with the schools, and the schools always say, well, you, everybody tries to bombard us with their, with, with their kinds of programs. But the school is a great catchment area, and it really, education, the, the, the education policy, I think, was reviewed of, of, of late, and I think it does include looking at how, how do we respond to the, to the human person and not just to their academic development. Because if, if they're, once you're educated people, it is not just about the academics, it is about the whole person. So how do we look at specific programs that we can really tailor to really address these? And I'm, I'm a big stickler for experiential work and experiential exercises, and I think that is one of the things that we, um, you know, we have to start envision how do we create school where it really mirrors life because even this situation is not really a real situation it's 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 uh it's something we kind of set up it's not it's not really real uh, so a classroom is not necessarily a real a real environment even though you are required you are required to do that so how then do we start to look at, how do we create, and, and this is just me thinking out loud, experiential, uh, experiential learning, not just in terms of doing academic work, but 
just as on a football field, we, we learn how to collaborate and be teammates. How do we encourage more of that in the classroom as well? And not just only when we are working on specific projects. Um, what, are, what, what are those models that, that, that have worked where um, you don't necessarily, I know that they, the school in France um, had some kind of open floor planning, which can facilitate that, that kind of learning. But to what extent are we also examining actually doing some of these things where we, where we recreate what a classroom really looks like? Not always bench desks and chairs, but then part of a general part of school is coming in, learning how to speak with people and how to get along, etc. So hopefully you have written down some of the implications and, and the opportunities. So that's the last question: is what does this mean for children, school community, and mental health professionals? And sorry, I won't answer that. <laughs> you answered that one. So pretty much, thank you very much. I want to think about those things, and then you can respond to that question. Great. We're almost out of time, so you can leave the last okay. Q&A. Great, so, like. questions. <laughs> what was the question, sorry? Oh, uh, so, so we're, we're looking at two huge questions, the implications and the opportunities. I'd very much like to hear opportunities. Based on the, the information that was just shared, um, in terms of the experiences that, are, that, that our young people are having, the trauma, uh, but it's not all, hope is not lost, so. What are the opportunities um, for, whether it is for the, the children, the school, the community, mental health professionals? Professionals. What are the opportunities? Yes. Well, my first question to you, so thanks for that um, presentation. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering, um, even though you're saying there weren't too many statistics about the family, for me, that would have been helpful to see what they were encountering at home as well as at school. And um, the question of, uh, you know, 54% had been bullied. Yes. Was it, did it, somebody had to be doing the bullying as well. Yes. So I just wondered whether there was a differentiation in that in your studies. Personally, I feel that we need to start with preschool children teaching conflict resolution yes. and I know that um, through the early childhood association that they're encouraging um, experiential learning and, and to, to focus around projects and, and encouraging that play is as important as serious studying yes. and you learn sometimes more by playing than you do by having to you know, you do um, learn by rote or other methods, so that that interaction for me that needs to start at preschool, and then you build that rapport with the families, and you will see the difference. Great. Just just, just to clarify, um, I did not get to go through the entire study, but I, I was not able to pick up the the, the, the issues on. On, on the family aspect, I was I was searching through. I didn't find that there were mentions of it. There were mentions of it, but it, it, it's over 100 plus pages, um, and, and, and I, I took out the, the, the parts that, that I really wanted to, to focus on. And I, I didn't remember actually picking up a part on the actual family where there were live stats. There there were some. There was more narrative based on what what, what I remember. Yeah. Uh, sorry, let's go there first, and then come to you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. For those who don't know what to do. Yeah. But um, from my work, the thing that I have been trying to, um, or what I've been experiencing is that, like, um, so, yeah, this is Julie was saying, I think it also, it starts at home, and what I've been doing a lot more is referring parents for parenting classes. Yes. Um, I believe we should have a lot more opportunities for that, I think, that also children at school are exposed to um, different types of education, just like mm -hmm. learning to play, learning like actual academics, but I think parents stop that once they stop school and when they have their children 
they, they, I think they too need to continue that kind of education, if you want to call it that. But I, I think a opportunity for that could be referring people for more parenting class. Parenting, parenting, yeah. Um, and, and just to say that the family resource um, do have a, yeah. they, 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 they have a program that facilitates that. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a small entity, and I'm not sure how many they, they actually do per month now. Mm -hmm. um, but to see, again, again that, 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 that is certainly something that can, that can be replicated along with collaborating with, with, with other agencies as well. Yes, I did say Yes. yes. Uh, just an opportunity, and I'm, I'm not um, as familiar with access points for children here, yes. but certainly um, just hearing some of the discussion about the culture and whether things are talked about or discussed uh, can make it very difficult for a child to come forward or to seek out help. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's confidential online yes. access points where they can then get connected and referred. Um, and they can go readily publicized and available at every school, on every door, in every bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. they can see it and they can just go somewhere, a quiet place, pick up a phone, and they don't have to worry about the logistics of going somewhere, who saw them, yeah. all that stuff. Sometimes that can be a good opportunity. Yeah. And, that, and that is not a difficult thing to, to actually set up. And I've, I've worked with, with, with a hotline called Friends Hotline. Again, it was toll free, funded by, by one of the telecommunication companies. Um, people called, they, they, the calls were locked, etc. And people were sent to, to various kinds of points. Mm -hmm. And that is something certainly worth exploring, definitely. Three years ago, we actually yes. formed the community We were working on uh, developing a hotline for children, and because the crisis center is the only on the island 24 hour crisis line, we sometimes we receive phone calls from children, especially mm -hmm. suicidal calls. But yeah, I agree, there is no specific you know, hotline just mm -hmm. for, for children. So, Miss Annie, I'm going to put you to task. Mm -hmm. oh, I try. I'm going to ask you to follow up and, and help us to get a sense of, of, of where that is. Because then, again, we, we, are, we, we can all be advocates and, and push to where something like that can really come on through because it, it is so much needed. And, and just, just being able to, to hear from those children and being able to log that information. <coughs> again, the government cannot disagree, with, especially with Pan American Health Organization. <laughs> you can't really I think the key is you know, to collaborate with DCFS yes. on that level.